morning. My name is Laura Geiner, and I am the program director at the Collection on Palmetto. We are a museum of brass era automobiles. So you might ask, what is the brass era? The brass era is a time um, in the automobile industry uh, that went from about 1896 to 1915, and it was a time of great growth um, in that industry. So when I first joined the collection on Palmetto, um, I was told that more technology transformed in that period than in any other time in history. And so we have mostly brass era automobiles. But in addition to being a museum, we are also a foundation. So we are a privately funded foundation, um, and our mission is to really educate people about the progression of technology through the brass era and beyond. We, um, we really want people of all ages to understand how important the automotive industry was at that time. Um, and so we welcome people, we welcome field trips, we have car clubs. Um, in the near future we will have a speaker series such as you guys have here. And um, so it's a really exciting place to be. I've been there for about five years and um, we've been open. We actually opened from before COVID began, from the pre-COVID era. But uh, then of course we had to kind of curtail our um, admissions at that time. Then we reopened recently, last year in October, on October 17th, we had our, our grand opening to the public and it was a wonderful community event. We saw about a thousand people in and out throughout the day, not at one time. Um, so um, as the program director, my job is to really create programs all around um, the public and especially education. My background is in teaching, so I was a teacher for, for many years, and, um, and then I was brought on board to really um, come up with ideas and programs around field trips. So as such, I've really focused on um, not only history, but technology. Um, and so I brought some examples of the things that we do. I'd like to go ahead and move over here for a moment, Alex, thank you. So some of the things we're really proud of are our simple machines activities, which were all made in-house. And so um, everyone at the collection is just very talented. We have educators, um, engineers, and, and mechanics, and machinists, people of all different trades really helping out as volunteers and paid staff. Um, but so this is um, an example of an inclined plane. So the children um, go into one of two activity rooms and they're able to experiment and do activities with different simple machines. This is a popular one because of course it has the Hot Wheels along with the inclined plane. Another activity that we do is the assembly line. So working together in groups, the children actually make these cars. They're I wouldn't call them toy cars, they're model cars, uh, but they look like toys, don't they? <laughs> but they make them um, as a group and they apply ideas um, which are related to the assembly line. So one person does the same thing over and over and over. So we talk about um, Henry Ford's contribution to mass production, uh, the collection on Palmetto, um, and that is something that goes along with that. And then we do another activity, hands-on activity, it is a circuit. So these are all um, pre-drilled to make it easy for the children to actually assemble it, and they do assemble it you know, with their own tools. And we really want to go back to a hands-on approach to, um, to things at the collection on Palmetto. We believe that's a very important um, thing for children to learn. So those are some of the activities that we do with them, and we have a lot more. We have electromagnetism, we have a telegraph, we do um, a really fun activity with the Orange Belt Railway, which I know you know here at the Historical Society that that was the narrow gauge railway that ran from Sanford all the way to St. Petersburg, and St. Petersburg was the terminus. So we actually have a ride on train. You've got to come visit. Uh, people of all ages love it. Um, so they ride on the train, and all around the property, it's a five-acre property, they um, they get to kind of experience what it would have been like. And the field trip students get to actually transport goods along the Orange Belt Railway 
we, we have, you know, oranges, they're fake oranges, but they're in crates, and they actually ride, they transport the goods to different um, stations. It's kind of a neat activity, um, and so when the general public comes, you know, we don't make them transport goods, but they still can ride the train. Trains are on Tuesdays, if anyone is interested. Um, that is the day we've set aside to always have the train out. We hope to start to have Saturdays as well, um, because we do understand people work as we do, <laughs> and can't always visit during the week. Um, so I brought a couple of other things. I, I brought a picture of the um, assembly line, um, a Ford's assembly line. So that is something we talk about when you visit the collection, you get a tour of all of the cars. We do have docent-led tours every day at one that we're open. We're open Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday at this point. Um, Saturdays by reservation. But you'll get a docent-led tour. Our docents are very familiar with the progression of technology, and not only technology, historical ideas around all of our cars. Um, so I brought a model of our earliest car. And this is the 1886 Benz Patton Motor Wagon. So this car um, was made by Carl Benz, and you're familiar, surely, with Mercedes-Benz. And um, he, so he is credited with creating the very first automobile because he obtained the patent for it. So certainly there were others who had created automobiles, but he did get the patent. So this is, uh, he's credited with having the first car. Um, and then our latest car is actually a Lamborghini. It's a 2014 Lamborghini. So when you go through, um, the kids love that one, and the doors open up like this, but um, you know, people will say, well, what place does this car have here in a collection of brass era automobiles? To which I say, well, the Lamborghini represents the end of an era in the large um, gasoline engines. But you'll find out, out all of that and more if you do come visit. Um, so another thing that we do at the collection that we've recently added is private events. Um, so I have some information over on that side of the table on a photograph that shows um, the beauty of those events. Um, it, it transforms, it's really transformed when we do have private events. So that is an entity separate from our nonprofit, uh, but that is something that they, they do there as well. My side is the museum side, so I really try to work with the community um, to improve the programs that we have. Um, we do have a board of directors. Um, in the future, I would like to see, as I've mentioned, increased programming. So we, you know, we have the field trips, um, we have the car clubs, we have charter bus tours. Um, I would like to see uh, the speaker series and then some additional exhibits. Right now, we have um, antique advertising or advertising um, of the era. So I brought a couple of examples of those. Um, now, ours in the museum for the exhibit are large. They're printed on very, very big vinyl banners behind each car to anchor each car. But I wanted to give you an example of um, some of the different, you know, these are primary sources. These are from actual publications. Here's one for a Cadillac. Um, I'm trying to see where... Oh. It's from a publication called Country Life in America magazine. Um, I don't have the date on this, but since they're advertising 1904 cars, I suspect it probably this is from 1903. Um, here's another one. Here's an 1893 McClure's magazine ad. Um, on this side, it has some interesting little tidbits. Um, for different pots and pans, and on this side it has an advertisement for a locomobile, which is uh, one of our cars. Actually, we have two locomobiles. Um, what people don't know about the time in history that we focus on, the brass era, is that in the 1900s, early 1900s, there were hundreds of automakers just competing to come up with a, a car that people would buy, that the consumer would, would want. Uh, to spend their money on. So just hundreds and hundreds, even as many as 400. So not all of the automakers made lots of cars. Some of them only made one. Um, but there was tremendous competition. 
And one of the things that um, automakers were looking at was methods of propulsion. So they were saying to themselves, you know, how would the automobile go? You know, would it be using an internal combustion engine? Would it be using um, electric? Would it be using steam? So steam was a very popular method of propulsion. And um, literally, when you run a steam car, you have water, you have a boiler, which heats the steam, you have a burner, uh, which provides the uh, heat, and it produces steam, the steam moves the pistons, and it, it just literally runs on steam, which is fascinating to me, and I wonder why we haven't really gone back to that, and perhaps we will, in fact. Well, we know we're going back to electricity, and that there are diff um, alternate forms of energy. So maybe even hydrogen. Um, so another thing that I'd like to focus on for future programs is um, women in automotive history. Um, and so this is Joan Newton Caneo. She was a race car driver born in 1876. And she raced automobiles. So she was, <clears throat> I would say, unpopular because it was very unheard of for a woman to, to drive you know, especially to race, but she did it. Um, they kind of ostracized her, but she's a very famous woman in automotive history. Um, speaking of racing, racing was done as a promotional um, venture at that time. They did a lot of different things to try to promote the automobile. They did racing, they did uphill climbs, they did even transcontinental trips. Um, so it was just like a very interesting time in history. Now, I don't have any examples really, um, but one of the other things we have at the collection is um, engines. They're these great big engines of industry and agriculture. Um, our biggest engine is a coreless engine, and that has a 12-foot flywheel. Now, have you guys ever been to Cracker Country at the fair? I highly suggest going there. We just were there for a field trip with our museum. Um, but they have this whole area where they have engines of agriculture and industry. Um, and they're actually in motion. They're operating under air. They are steam engines, but they don't operate them on steam anymore because it can be a little bit dangerous, I guess, to do so and costly. But we have those very same engines, similar engines to those. So one of the main and most important things that I guess I would say about our museum is it really is a living museum like Cracker Country because our cars are all operational. They're not static. It is not a static display. They don't just sit there. You will go in. Just the other day I was there and Tim was out there working on the Pierce Arrow. A 1927, you know, a hundred year old car was being fixed so it could be driven. You know, and you'll see the owners and others driving the cars around even in this area. So it's very important to us that the cars all operate. And that said, there is a little bit of, um, there's a lot to actually getting 100-year-old cars to, to work initially and then to continue working. And I was going to ask Tim, who uh, also works at the collection on Palmetto, if he would just speak about that for a moment. Tim, would you like to speak for a moment? Sure. Yeah, so I'm, um, I'm fairly new at the museum. Uh, my background um, has been automotive and, and marine driven. Um, and, and it's, it's, you know, I thought I, I was familiar with a, a lot of the things uh, that I've worked on over the years and moving into the, the older cars. Um, but I can tell you, yeah, they were very, very creative, very clever, um, and, and genius, really brilliant in a lot of ways in how they, they put these cars together. So um, my job is to go through um, the museum, uh, go through each car, and get it running if it's not, and if it is running, to maintain it. And as I have started to do that, I see that uh, every model is different. Um, so the, the principles of the combustion engine of course, still carry today. Uh, however, I am on um, the steam engines, which is totally new to me, uh, and also the, uh, the fixed, the large, like the cordless. Um, you know, I get to also be part of that, and, um, and very interesting to see how all of this works. Um, 
you know, I can say that um, it's kind of a, a dream job in a lot of ways. Um, uh, a very beautiful place, and it, it really helps me connect to our past. So with me working on them uh, hands-on, uh, it really brings me back to a period of time in, in the country here and how many things were going on and, and how we progressed so rapidly into what we have today. And it really, um, it really was this period of time, the, the, the bronze, um, the brass uh, era of cars. So it's, um, it's been good. It's, it's, it's very interesting. Um, the other thing that I've recognized is I can't call the auto store for parts. So, uh, you know, you do have to be creative in, in coming up with parts. Um, they have a full working machine shop on the facility, so, um, you know, if, if it's something that can be made, they make it. Um, as well as if it, you know, Laura's been wonderful in this, is, you know, she's found a lot of resources, so we're able to reach out to other places, find things maybe sitting, um, as well as that's helped my job a tremendous amount is uh, the material that she's found, um, you know, and she's collected together. So, uh, again, these are vehicles I can't open a shop manual for in most, most cases. So it's, it's been an experience. It's been wonderful, though, and, and uh, incredibly amazing for me to work on things 100 plus years old. I will be moving into the steam engines next, so looking very forward to that. This is also something that the age group of people that have the information that can help and support, they're starting to leave us, so um, it's becoming harder to find um, people that can really help vocally. So we're, we're having to go back to a lot of the resources that are on paper. It's been wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. <laughs> so, what, um, so one of the uh, great pleasures of my job has been to do a lot of the research. So in addition to doing programming, I really had to find out a lot about all of the cars. So it's been just a great education for me um, because I came into this not knowing anything about cars, actually, <laughs> uh, or engines especially, or the orange belt, or anything. So I was just, um, previously I was teaching first grade. Um, so now I really developed as a person, I've learned a great deal about uh, local history um, and just history in general, especially um, industry and the automotive industry. Um, and I'm returning to school now and getting my master's degree um, in education. So that all kind of is, uh, I would say that the museum is a place of growth. It's a place of growth for people who work there, those who volunteer, and those who visit. Um, if you're interested in volunteering, I will say that we greatly welcome all volunteers. We need, I know you guys do too, and I know we've discussed how volunteerism has waned in the historical societies and museums. And everyone I've talked to has you know, said that is the case. But we greatly welcome volunteers any amount of time, any day of the week that we're open. Um, we need docents who will educate themselves with help and be trained about the automobiles and this, the narrative. We need um, you know, people to do um, just general volunteering to, to work at the, um, or volunteer at the gift shop where they can you know, um, admit people into the museum and also help them check out and buy some little things. Um, so volunteerism is something high on my priority list in addition to my own personal growth. Um, I will say, you know, the way we got started is that the founders, the founders of the collection on uh, Palmetto, they were really into, they were in manufacturing actually for many years in this area. So we have roots in this area. Um, they had two automobiles in the family, which were Stanley Steamers. And that's a really iconic name in the automobile industry. Most people have at least heard of that. Um, so we have quite a few Stanley Steamers, and that was their interest to begin with. Um, and what happened was they had a Stanley Steamer that had been unrepaired for many years and um, in need of restoration. But they began to drive it around in tours. And so there's a hobby associated with these old automobiles, 
And that is people trailer their automobiles to different destinations around the country and they meet up as groups and in those groups they visit different places like um, museums or farms or you know different things, sites, and they eat together, they stay in the same hotel, uh, it's like an organized event for the club. And as they did this, they found, wow, it's just so wonderful to meet with different people and talk about these cars that we really love and enjoy. And there are so many others who have this same passion. So this began the collecting of these automobiles through time. And um, they would tour and meet with friends, uh, new friends and old, and um, enjoy eating and ice cream stops. And they finally said when they were touring with this one that had been in the family that was in great need of restoration, they finally said, you know, let's restore this and make it beautiful again. And they did. And that car is at the collection on Palmetto. It's a 1913 Stanley Model 64. It's a cute little two-seater roadster. It's what we call a touring car because touring cars, they're like convertibles. Um, they have a top that goes down versus like an enclosed cab. Um, so it's a, a 1913 Model 64 Touring. And you'll see that one in 20, about 25 other automobiles when you go. You'll get a tour of the veranda, which houses all of our engines of industry and agriculture. Steam on the east side, gas engines on the west side. Uh, and you'll get a train ride, which is, I think, one of the more popular uh, attractions at the collection on Palmetto. We do offer free admission to veterans. Um, we offer free admission to teachers. We uh, also offer uh, free admission to first responders. Um, children are $5, seniors are $5, um, and a regular admission is 10. Car clubs are $10. Uh, and field trips, we do charge $10 as well. We're located, oh, and actually, we were looking at your wonderful map. We are right, literally, in the heart of Clearwater. So we're in Clearwater, Florida. We're, um, we think we're right in this area, actually. But um, we're right between, so our address is 2116 Palmetto Street in Clearwater, and it's between Belcher and Hercules just a little bit south of Sunset Point, but not quite to Old Coachman. So we're in that industrial area. It's always a big surprise when people turn and they think they're turning into kind of an, it's like an industrial kind of an area. There's a big warehouse storage facility now in the corner. People are, they're building it. And then they turn into the collection on Palmetto. And it's like this complete departure from everything in the surrounding area. It's just gorgeously landscaped uh, on five acres, just a plethora of exquisite trees, bamboo stands, live oaks, um, Hong Kong orchids. It's um, been a site for people to see, even um, people with the Florida Native um, Plant Society, photography groups. It's just something very unusual. Yeah, you'll be surprised. So we do have the, um, the black, like wrought iron fencing around it and a gate. Uh, the gates are open when we're open. <laughs> and we have a beautiful little um, lake. We call it Turtle Lake. It actually was an upland borrow pit. Um, and we excavated, we had to excavate that when we built, um, you know, to provide for a runoff. Um, and so it's now Turtle Lake. And in it, we have just tons of different species of animals enjoying it. Snapping turtles. Uh, mallard ducks, moorhens, I believe, is another one. There's a raccoon. Um, we just have lots of snakes, you know, nothing dangerous, but beautiful, just creatures all around. And um, it's just such a beautiful place to go. We have picnic tables by the lake, too, which allows for people. I've seen people having coffee out there. They don't even come in. They just go enjoy coffee by the lake, which we're fine with. Um, and then the field trip students eat their lunches by the lake, and it's very, very nice. Um, so it's funny when, well, I don't know if it's funny, <laughs> it's when we first opened, you know, I had a hundred kids coming, I was so excited, it was my first field trip, and then COVID hit. So boom, we had to, they canceled, we had to cancel. 
Um, but now we're seeing more and more people are venturing um, out from their schools and, and to field trips. Um, so um, we've seen Plato Academy schedule quite a few lately. Plato Academy is just literally right down the road. They can walk to us. So they're sending a whole bunch of groups, and we're, we're thankful for that connection. Um, but we have had quite a few schools coming in. Just a couple of weeks ago, we had 200 kids coming in through the week. Um, they were from a, a single school, but what they elected to do, the principal elected to send, you know, second, one, one day, third, fourth, fifth, which worked out perfectly. And then, um, so it's really nice, because my background is in education. Tim also was an instructor. Um, two of our volunteers also have degrees in education. Um, and so, and then we have some volunteers who are retirees who um, love to be there. One of the things I would love to see is people dressing in period attire. We do have a couple of volunteers who do that. Jay Archer is one of our volunteers and he dresses up as Henry Ford and he does a whole talk on Henry Ford. It's amazing. And um, so he's just got so much knowledge about that. But um, I would love to see more of that if any volunteer would like to do that. We would even provide the, um, the clothes if they were willing to do that. We very much do. So we have a 1901 Curve Dash Oldsmobile. It's a really an American icon. So we definitely talk about Ransom Eli Olds and our connection and his connection to Oldsmar. I speak a lot about that because I actually grew up over there by Oldsmar. And so the tremendous growth we've seen in that area is, um, well, it's just amazing. Um, but yeah, we do talk about that. We like to bring in elements of local history because that's very important to the children who visit um, uh, with their schools. We also have um, recently added a model of the 1914 Benoit, which is the train, the, uh, excuse me, plane. It's, it was the plane that flew, to Tony Janis flew it over, I'm sure you know, I'm not telling you anything you don't know, um, over Tampa Bay and it was the first commercial airline flight. And it was a, um, an airboat, I believe is what they call that. It took off from the water, landed on the water, but we had that installed. The uh, Florida Aviation Historical Society, it's on loan from them, and they installed it with our, with our help, which is exciting. And so it's a model. It's a one-third scale model, but it's really an exact replica. It even has a working engine. So that's a fascinating element of local history as well. Um, we do have some other things that um, sort of you know, mesh with the local history of Florida. Yeah, we haven't established a partnership per se. However, we're friends with them. So um, Olivier and Susan Surf, we're, we are friends with them and they attended our private uh, grand opening gala. So we uh, really do need to talk about that with them. We're a perfect partnership because um, the Tampa Automotimo Automobile, Automotive Museum, excuse me, they have primarily um, European, many, many, many wonderful European cars, whereas we, are a museum of mostly American cars. So it, we really do bounce off each other very nicely and we're in a close area. So I'm really glad you mentioned that. Um, I will say one connection, another connection we have is one of our cars is a Winton automobile. And I don't know if you guys have ever seen Dr. Um, Horatio Nelson, Horatio's Drive, it's a PBS movie. It was about the first transcontinental trip across our country. It, well, he drove from California to New York and it took him two months, over two months, to do so. But he did it in a Winton. And so we have not that Winton, but we have a Winton. Um, it, a similar year, ours is 1906. He did that tour in 1903. But we talk about him. And the neat thing, the neat connection there is Alexander Winton, the founder of that company, that car, um, his great grandson lives in Sarasota. And we're friends with him. And in fact, that gentleman, Charlie Wake, actually gave us a, a car that we have in our collection, which is a horse-drawn buggy, which is the Columbus buggy. So it's kind of neat. It's a small world of um, uh, collectors, enthusiasts, hobbyists, and people who love history. And we see in the collection on Palmetto all of those things combined. Um, so we're really pleased to be able to offer that to people. Right here, right here in the heart of Clearwater.